Welcome to our discussion on how numbers deceive. Just know that numbers don't really lie. It's just people misinterpreting them. A lot of the examples uh, in this section are what are called Simpson's paradox. So we're going to look at polygraphs and mammograms and a couple other things, and most of them come from uh, Simpson's paradox, and I'll explain that later. Let's look at our first example. So down below we have basketball shots in the first half and second half of the game. But before looking at the table, if someone just told you that Kevin had a higher shooting percentage both in the first half, 40% to 25%, and in the second half, 75% to 70%, does this mean that Kevin had the better shooting percentage for the game? No, because we don't know how much each player shot, right? We just have percentages. If you tried to compare percentages, it's kind of like saying you can average percentages, and you can't do that. Because when you look at the absolute numbers, look what happens. So, Kevin shot 40% in the first half. Kobe only shot 25%, but that was 4 for 10 and 1 for 4. And then in the second half, Kevin was 75%, 3 for 4. And Kobe was 70%, but that was 7 for 10. When you actually do the math, when you actually add up the numbers, you can see that Kevin, right, had a total of 7 out of 14, right, 3 plus 4, and then Kobe had 8 out of 14. So even without doing any um, math to figure out what the actual percentage is, you can see that Kobe did better. And if we do the actual math, we can see that it's, you know, 50% versus 57.1%. And it's all because the two players didn't have the same number of uh, shot attempts in each half so you can't just look at just the percentages and that's really the crux of simpson's paradox is when you have uneven group sizes okay let's talk about some vocabulary when you talk about a, a test doing a test like a, a lie detector test or um, you know an hiv test or a mammogram anything that is supposed to come back with either a positive or a negative result you have four options. You have a true positive where the test is accurate. It actually catches a positive result. <clears throat> you have a false positive where the test incorrectly reports a positive result. And then a true negative, so it correctly says a negative result, and then a false negative. So basically it can be right two ways and it can be wrong two ways. <clears throat> Let's look at an example with this in mind. So based on the table below, what is the percentage of women with negative test results who actually have cancer? So negative test results who actually have cancer. That's a false negative. Now I know you might think, well, cancer is a bad thing. So if you have cancer, doesn't that mean you have a negative test result? No. A positive test result means it it shows up for what you're testing for. If you're testing for cancer and you have cancer, the test will come back positive for cancer, saying it's found the cancer. A negative basically means you don't have what you're testing for, so in this case you wouldn't have cancer. I know it's a kind of a, a, like a double negative, but that's how it works. So if we look at the numbers, this first column, the tumor is malignant. That means the person has cancer. And then the second column, the tumor is benign, that means the person had a tumor but it wasn't cancerous. Okay, this first row are all the people who had a positive mammogram, which means the mammogram came back and said, you have cancer. And then the, the second row, the negative, came back and said, you do not have cancer. So th these 85 people who had a cancerous tumor, the test was right, it was a true positive. These 1485 people who had a benign um, tumor, the test came back and said, that they had cancer, so those were wrong. All those people got scared for nothing. These people had cancer, but the test said they didn't, so that's kind of bad. And then these people didn't have cancer, and the test said they didn't, so that's good, right? So these two corners, the test did what it was supposed to do, and these two is where the test made a mistake. And this is actually real world kind of stuff. This actually happens, which is why anytime they um, run things that are important, like mammograms and HIV tests and things like that, they'll run them twice to help catch these mistakes. Okay, so based on the numbers, what is the percentage of women with negative test results who actually have cancer? Well, women with negative test results are all of these people. 
<clears throat> how many of them actually have cancer? Well, these. So what percentage of those women have cancer? It's basically 15 out of the total, right? All of them, 84, 30. And that's going to be your answer. And here's where we do the, the math. And we can see 0.18%. That's not 18%. That's 0.18%, less than 1%. So in other words, the chance that a woman with a negative mammogram has cancer is very, 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 very small, right? I mean, look at the numbers. Only 15 out of 8,430 basically got the wrong result. When it said you don't have cancer, they actually had it. Okay, polygraphs, same kind of idea because a polygraph gives you one or the other. Either it says you lied or it says you didn't. Suppose that um, a thousand people take the polygraph, 10 of whom lie, and the polygraph is 90% accurate. How many of those applicants who were accused of lying were actually telling the truth? Well, if we break it down with a tree diagram, we can see here are applicants. 10 of them lie, 990 of them tell the truth. But if the polygraph is 90% accurate, then 90% of these will be caught as a lie. So 90% of 10 is 9. So it catches 9 liars. One liar gets away with it. If it's 90% accurate over here, then 90% of these will come back saying you told the truth. 891. But 10% of them will be falsely accused of lying. And 10% of that is 99. So when we add this together, we have 108 people accused of lying. The nine liars here and the 99 people who are falsely accused. So you can see that when the two sides of the test are unevenly weighted, right? There were only 10 liars and there were 990, you tell the truth, a much bigger right, group in one category. It skews the results. This test really no longer feels like it's 90% accurate because out of the 108 people who were accused of lying, only nine of them actually lied. That feels like a 9% like a accuracy rate, right? That's Simpson's paradox. Here's another example with um, drug testing. You have a 95% accurate drug test, and if you give it to a bunch of athletes where only 4% of them actually use the drug, see, we've got this un unevenly weighted sample where 4% don't do drugs and 96% do. So that 95% accuracy is no longer going to be 95% because of those two different size groups. Well, we don't want to deal with percentages, so let's instead just pretend there's a 1,000 athletes. <clears throat> so now, if 4% do drugs, that means only 40 of them do drugs. 960 of them don't do drugs. Just like in the previous example, we can apply the 95% accuracy to each group, knowing that 95% of the 40 drug users will come back with positive results, which is 38. Two of them will get away with it, right? And then we know that 95% of the clean Athletes will come back with a clean result, but 5% of them will come back with a false positive, basically accusing them of using drugs even though they didn't. And when you do 5% of 960, you get 48. So you get 48 um, athletes that are accused of using drugs even though they didn't. And you had 38 of the 40 who were doing drugs that were, that were you know, rightfully accused of it. When you put that together, there's 86 total, if we had 1,000, there are 86 total that come back with positive results. But out of those, 48 were falsely accused. So 56% of the people who were accused of using drugs were actually falsely accused. And that test no longer feels like it has a 95% accuracy rate. See, so this is what they mean by uh, numbers deceiving. It's Simpson's paradox, and it really comes down to uh, two samples right are two groups that are hugely disproportionate one group has a lot more things in it than the other and then when you start taking percentages of those two groups even though you have a small error a small error of a really large group ends up being bigger than a large accuracy rate for a very small group the last way that uh, numbers can deceive really comes down to displaying data. The following two graphs, these two graphs are basically taken from the same amount, of the same data. The data is accurate. The graphs are actually, actually accurate. But the way they display the numbers become very misleading. One graph makes it seem like the rich pay more with the new proposed tax cuts, and the other graph makes it seem like they pay less. So that's really not the numbers misleading, it's people misleading. So the two main ways where numbers can deceive in, in, in this section is Simpson's paradox and then just misleading graphs.